10 facts about Moses that many people do not know. Number 1. Moses asked God to remove his name from the Book of Life. What happened for Moses to make this statement? And what can we learn from this? This took place at the same time as the worship of the Golden Calf. The parable of the Golden Calf sheds light on human nature and the tendency of individuals to move away from their commitment to God. It is ironic that while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelites were breaking the First Commandment, which states that thou shalt not have any gods before me. The Israelites' impatience with Moses on Mount Sinai led them to come up with the idea of creating a new god to go up before them or worship. In order to achieve this, they melted down their gold jewelry and used it to construct the golden calf out of it. The people's impatience caused them to turn to Aaron, and they gave him the responsibility of serving as their spiritual guardian in place of Moses. Aaron obediently obliged with a request by transforming their golden earrings into a golden sculpted calf, which was a behavior that was specifically prohibited. Then they began to indulge in revelry, worshipping the idol, while also engaging in immoral behavior, such as eating, drinking, and playing. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 32 verses 7 through 8. Moses descended the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony, met Joshua on the way, and came to the people as they were carrying on their sensual, idolatrous feast. In righteous anger, he broke the tablets of the law as a witness of what the people had already done. Exodus chapter 32 verses 31 through 34. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. Moses did not sugarcoat the severity of the sin committed by the people or attempt to downplay its impact. They were responsible for glorifying a deity of gold. Despite the enormity of the people's sin, Moses asked for forgiveness. This was an appeal to God's mercy and grace. Moses begged God to forgive Israel because of his own self-sacrificed identification with the sinful people. If God refused to forgive, Moses asked to be damned as a sacrifice for his sinful people. Moses felt that Israel had sinned so terribly that the blood of a goat or an ox couldn't cover it. It had to be a man who suffered in their place. Therefore, he offered to be blotted out of God's book if it could somehow rescue the people. God said no to Moses' request, but we can say that God was looking forward to the sacrifice of one greater than Moses, who would give himself for the people, bringing full and complete atonement. Of course, Jesus had the same sacrificial heart when he died for our sins. God agreed to spare the nation, but reserved the right to judge individual sinners. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. 
This was God's promise to stay faithful to Israel and to keep his presence with them. My angel shall go before you. Number 2. Moses and the Nehushtan Idol The biblical books of King refer to the image of a serpent coiled around a pole as the Nehushtan. The image is described in the book of Numbers. Following their deliverance from Egypt, the people began to complain to God about the conditions of their lives, and as a direct response, God dispersed among them fiery serpents. Many of the people ended up passing away, and many more were dying. In response to Moses' prayer, God commanded that a bronze serpent be lifted on a pole, and promised that anyone who looked at the bronze serpent would be healed of the snake bite they had received. The Israelites started worshipping the fiery serpent that Moses had made out of bronze sometime in the time period between Moses and Hezekiah. The bronze serpent mentioned in connection with Hezekiah's reforms, but the Nehushtan worship could have been taking place long before Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4 He removed the high places of pagan worship, broke down the images, memorial stones, and cut down the Asherim. He also crushed to pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the Israelites had burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan, a bronze sculpture. Even though it is easy to see how something that brought miraculous healing could become an object of worship, it was still blatant disobedience to God's commands. The bronze serpent was God's method of deliverance during the incident recorded in Numbers 21. There was not the slightest hint that God ever intended for it to have any further application. It's interesting to note that the literal translation of the word Nehushtan is piece of brass. It's possible that Hezekiah gave it the name Nehushtan so that people would be reminded that it was just a piece of brass. It did not contain any power at all. Even in the situation described in Numbers 21, it was God who brought about healing, not Nehushtan. A powerful lesson for all of us to learn from Nehushtan is that even good things and good people have the potential to become idols in our lives. All of our adoration, praise, and thanksgiving should be directed solely towards God. Nothing else, regardless of its amazing history, is worthy. Number 3. Why was God going to kill Moses in Exodus? God picked Moses to free the Israelites from Egypt's servitude and guide them to the promised land. Moses is also known as the giver of the law and the Old Covenant's mediator. The encounter with God at the burning bush, where God invited Moses to be the savior of his people, was a key event in Moses' life. The Lord promised Moses that he would deliver his people from Egypt and bring them into a land of abundance, that is, Canaan. Forty years after fleeing to Midian, Moses returned to Egypt at God's command. He went with his wife and sons, Zipporah, Gershom, and Eliezer. But before Moses could deliver the message, he had to learn obedience himself. He had failed to circumcise his own son, Gershom or Eliezer, possibly because of Zipporah's opposition. Exodus chapter 4 verses 24 through 26. But it came about at the overnight encampment on the way that the Lord met Moses and sought to put him to death. So Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, You are indeed a groom of blood to me. So we left him alone. At that time, she said, You are a groom of blood because of the circumcision. Moses was about to be extinguished by God because of his wrongdoing. 
The nature of Moses' trespass is not revealed clearly in Exodus chapter 4 verses 24 through 26, but the surrounding circumstances provide significant hints. The sacred rite of circumcision, which symbolized the Almighty's covenant with his chosen people, appears to have been overlooked by Moses. This could have been due to his surrogate Midianite tribe's pressure. Zipporah, who obviously found circumcision unpleasant, may have also convinced him not to circumcise his son. This would explain her rage. She believed that by shedding her son's blood, she had spared her husband's life. Moses had disobeyed God's commandment, yet God is now saying to Moses, I don't just use everyone, I use those who are holy and upright. You and I know that we're not holy and righteous in and of ourselves, and that we are righteous through Christ alone, but that doesn't mean we continue to sin so grace can abound. Moses was going to go back and represent God, yet he had not done what a righteous representative of God would do, even with his own children, and so God sought to slay Moses. God is very severe in his judgments because he's letting people know I'm not a God to be trifled with. Therefore, as Moses is going to be the deliverer, he had to work on areas of his own life that he was out of step with because God is holy. This level of judgment is also applied to the Israelites. God shows us that he is not going to use an unrighteous people to judge other people. Moses was unfit to serve as a spiritual leader because of his unresolved sin, and the problem had to be remedied before he could carry out his task properly. As soon as Zipporah completed the task, the Lord let him go. In short, God was planning to slay Moses since he was supposed to teach the Israelites God's law, but he was breaking it himself. Number 4. Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. Sometimes the punishment does not seem to fit the crime, and at first glance, Moses striking a rock in the desert out of frustration with the Israelites does not appear to be a just reason for him to forego seeing the promised land. After all, he'd seen the ten plagues, led Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, delivered the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, and won many of Israel's battles. So why would God allow a single rock strike in Meribah to keep Moses from entering the land that God had promised Israel? The Israelites complained to Moses about their lack of water. They also put the Lord to the test. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. There you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may have something to drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Exodus chapter 17 verses 4 through 6 Water flows from the rocks, providing a drink for the Israelites. In essence, the Israelites approached Moses with a problem. Moses went up to God. God gave Moses specific instructions. As Moses followed, water began to flow. Consider what happens at the second Meribah, when Moses becomes frustrated and disobeys God. Numbers 20 contains the second miracle. The Israelites arrive in the Zin Desert near Kadesh. The Israelites again complained to Moses about a lack of water. Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 through 13 Then the Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, in the fortieth year after leaving Egypt. 
and the people lived in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. The people contended with Moses and said, If only we had perished when our brothers perished in the plague before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness to die here, we and our livestock? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or of figs or of vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting, tabernacle, and fell on their faces before the Lord in prayer. Then the glory and brilliance of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, and speak to the rock in front of them, so that it will pour out its water. In this way, you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their livestock drink fresh water. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. Moses said to them, Listen now, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his hand in anger, and with his rod he struck the rock twice, instead of speaking to the rock as the Lord had commanded. And the water poured out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank fresh water. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed, trusted me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, you therefore shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, contention, strife, where the sons of Israel contended with the Lord, and he showed himself holy among them. Moses had grown tired of God's people. They contested him, contested God, and contested Moses' administration at every bend. At first glance, it appears that God is punishing Moses severely. After all, Moses had faithfully followed God's instructions up to this point. Couldn't God just let this go? Did he go too far? First, we must understand that the first striking of the rock foreshadows Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 5. For I do not want you to be unaware, believers, that our fathers were all under the cloud in which God's presence went before them, and they passed miraculously and safely through the Red Sea, and all of them were baptized into Moses, into his safekeeping as their leader, in the cloud and in the sea. And all of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not well pleased with most of them, for they were scattered along the ground in the wilderness, because their lack of self-control led to disobedience which led to death. Moses obeyed God by striking the rock in Exodus 17. But Moses disobeyed God by striking the rock rather than speaking to it in Numbers 20. The incident in Numbers 20 was Moses' second strike on the rock, the first being in Exodus 17. As a result, we teach that Moses was punished for striking the rock twice, rather than striking it twice in Numbers 20. According to 1 Corinthians, God intended the rock in the desert to be a representation of His Son, Jesus Christ. In Exodus 17, the Lord told Moses to strike the rock in order to establish a picture of Christ as our Redeemer. Christ is our rock and cornerstone, who has been struck for our sake, and He will bring forth streams of living water, 
as stated repeatedly in Psalms and Isaiah. Furthermore, the book of Hebrews states that Christ died once and for all, and that no further atonement for sins is required. So in the Exodus 17 scene, the Lord intended Moses to strike the rock in the desert only once, symbolizing Jesus being sacrificed only once to bring us salvation. Later in Numbers 20, the Lord instructed Moses to only speak to the rock so that the image created in Exodus 17 could be preserved. When Moses chose to strike the rock a second time, he threw a wrench into the Exodus 17 picture. We would have been perplexed by the distorted picture if God had not corrected Moses' error, concluding that Christ, the rock, had to be sacrificed repeatedly for our salvation. As a result, God chastised Moses to ensure that we correctly understood the image of the rock, preventing Moses from entering the promised land. During the process, the Lord created a new image to help people understand salvation correctly. By refusing to let Moses enter the promised land, the Lord demonstrated that we cannot enter salvation, meaning the promised land, through the works of the law, meaning Moses, but only through the work of Jesus, that means by Joshua, which is the name Yeshua, or Jesus. When God instructed him to speak to a rock in order to obtain water for the nation, he struck it in rage. He reacted in rage rather than with poise, and as a result, he was barred from entering the promised land. Number 5. The Magicians That Moses Faced Janes and Jambres The narrative of Pharaoh's magicians can be found in Exodus 7 and 8, when Moses and Aaron confront the Pharaoh in Egypt and demand that he frees God's people from slavery. In order to validate their message, Moses and Aaron performed miracles. Moses held a special place in history due to the extraordinary number and variety of miraculous feats that were attributed to him. As it is written, all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed, we learn that Moses was unparalleled in the power and authority with which he led the people of Israel. We are told that there has not been another prophet like Moses to arise in Israel since that time. However, there have been great rulers of Israel, as well as leaders, prophets, and priests. But before the arrival of Jesus Christ, who is known as the Messiah, there was never another man who held all offices in such a glorious manner as Moses did. Even with the miracles of Moses, he faced the opposition of Janus and Jambres. God gave Moses and Aaron the instruction to show Pharaoh a sign at their first encounter with the king by hurling Aaron's staff to the ground. God was aware that Pharaoh would demand a sign. After Aaron did so, the staff in his hand transformed into a snake. The Pharaoh wasted no time in calling for his magicians, each of whom was able to transform their own staff into serpents. Aaron's snake ate the snakes that were being used by the magicians, which must have been interpreted as an ominous warning for Pharaoh's court. Exodus chapter 7 verses 8 through 13 Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Work a miracle to prove your authority. Then you say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, so that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and did just as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called for the wise men, skilled in magic and omens, and the sorcerers, skilled in witchcraft, and they also, these magicians, soothsayer, priests of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts and enchantments. 
for every man threw down his staff, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Pharaoh's magicians were successful in performing miracles twice more, matching the signs that Moses and Aaron had shown them. The first plague that Moses called down upon the Egyptians was a plague of blood. The magicians were also able to turn water to blood as Moses had done to the Nile River. Exodus chapter 7 verses 19 through 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and extend your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, over their pools, and over all their reservoirs of water, so that they may become blood, and there will be blood through all the land of Egypt, both in containers of wood and in containers of stone. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned into blood. Then the fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. But the soothsayer priests of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. This is great foolishness here on the part of the magicians. The plagues were a curse from God. Rather than attempt even to reverse the curse, they decided to turn more water into blood. They also added to the curse of their people. Such is the way of the dark arts. Their aim was not to alleviate the troubles of the people of Egypt. The evil one was trying to show significance rather than help those under him. It was a demented way of thinking, and alas, they did nothing to help their people. The second plague that was visited upon the Egyptian people was a swarm of frogs, and the magicians added to the problem by conjuring their own frogs rather than finding a solution to it. This made the situation even worse. After this, however, the magician's authority stopped as they could not reproduce any further plagues and they admitted they were witnessing the finger of God in Moses' signs. Exodus chapter 8 verse 19 Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the supernatural finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Satan had given Pharaoh's magicians the power to duplicate some of the signs God performed through Moses and Aaron. So how were the Egyptian magicians ever able to pull off these incredible feats in the first place? Although not as powerful as God, Satan, formerly one of God's highest angels, can deceive, emulate miracles, and even tell the future with a certain degree of accuracy. God's might eventually succeeded in foiling the Egyptian sorcerer's plans. They were not successful in calling forth gnats. The strength of God is vast enough to easily overcome the force of Satan. The ability to do miracles by the power of darkness and the willingness to receive them as authentic will characterize the end times. Even as Jannah's and Jambra's power had boundaries, so did Satan's authority. Even in the last days, God is still in control. There is hope, triumphant hope in Jesus. Miracles can be used to prove something is supernatural, but they cannot be used to prove something is true. These Egyptian magicians were intelligent, learned men. However, Paul observed that they did not have the wisdom that comes from God. 
Some of us are amazed by any real spiritual power without carefully considering that real power may have a sinister source instead of a godly one. And even if a new power seems to have the answers we've been looking for, we must not be seduced by it, because demonic forces can come masquerading as angels of light. Number 6. The Only Man That God Buried God has chosen to withhold such information from us regarding the events leading up to Moses' passing. Moses ascended the heights of Mount Nebo, while Israel camped out in the plains of Moab. From there, he had a clear view of the entire promised land, all the way to the coast of the Western Sea. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verses 1 through 3 now Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, from Gilead to Dan, and all Naphtali in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah to the Western Sea, Mediterranean Sea, and the Negev, South Country, and the plain in the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. What an honorable title! Moses is distinguished as the servant of Jehovah. He exemplified this throughout his life by working hard at all he did. Because he waited on God for his instructions like a servant waits on his master and made it his goal to conduct himself by the pattern that had been presented to him on the holy mountain, as a servant, Moses was devoted to God. You don't see him overburdening or ignoring his office. His regard for the Lord's name was profound. His loyalty to the Lord's cause was unwavering, and his faith in the Lord's word was unwavering. But servant of God as Moses was, he must die. It is the fate that befalls most men. Only two people can leave this world and enter the abodes of glory without ever having to cross the river of death. Moses is not one of the two. At the end of Moses' life, God gave Moses a glimpse of the land he had left Egypt for. Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah. There is a Pisgah where we also must pass and be gathered to our fathers. May we climb to it as willingly as did Moses, the servant of God. The manner of Moses' death is exceedingly remarkable. The circumstances surrounding Moses' passing are pretty extraordinary. Mount Pisgah has a summit elevation of 4,500 feet, nearly a mile. There aren't many 120-year-old men who can climb a mountain almost a mile high and live to tell the tale. However, Moses could. He managed it by scrambling hand over hand. There was no trail wide enough for Moses, and he didn't need one anyway. If you're wondering what condition he was in, that feat will tell you. Yet here was Moses, nearly a century and a quarter old, climbing to the top of a 4,500 foot high peak and having a great time once there. Moses is not full of self-pity. The extraordinary scene of the man of God standing alone on the summit of the mountain with a view of Canaan spread out below him. He was not caught by surprise. His death was long foreseen. Moses knew some time before that he must die without setting foot in Canaan. The great man had thus abundant knowledge of his own departure. I must add that while Moses' death demonstrates God's loving wisdom, the manner in which he died amply demonstrates God's grace. After Moses had been assured that he would die, there was never a complaint or even a prayer against it. His death was the culmination of his life. He realized he had achieved his purpose. He had been tasked with leading the people through the forest, which he had done. Furthermore, he died in the best company possible. Some men die most fittingly in the company of their children. 
Their strength has been laid in their home duties and attachments, and their offspring fitly closed their eyes. But there was no true kindred for the man Moses. Moses died according to the word of the Lord. What a way to live. A hundred and twenty and you don't need glasses. A century and a fifth and you don't need crutches. Moses never did sit around in a rocking chair rubbing on liniment and drinking ensher. But verse 6 contains one of the most remarkable statements about the whole remarkable career of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 6 And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows where his burial place is to this day. God personally buried Moses, the only person in the Bible. Did you notice that? Number 7. The location of his body is unknown. The Lord then concealed the tomb. What compelled him to do so? Because that grave would have become a shrine. They'd still be beating a path up Nebo today, erecting shrines, selling popcorn and peanuts, providing various rides, and possibly even sending a tram up there with enormous banners declaring Moses' burial place. So, it was concealed. This was so crucial to the Lord that it even sparked an angelic confrontation. Number 8. The Devil Fought for Moses' Body Jude verse 9 refers to an event not found anywhere else in the Bible. Michael had to struggle or dispute with Satan about the body of Moses, but what that entailed is not described. Jude 9 Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. This event occurs in Jude. Here Jude shares with us an incident that is found nowhere else in the Bible. The question naturally arises, where did he get this information? Some say that the information was passed down by tradition. This may or may not be so. We have no definite knowledge why the dispute arose between Michael and Satan about the body of Moses. It is not unlikely that Satan wanted to know the spot to have a shrine built there. Michael refused to presumptuously render judgment. Instead, he simply announced the Lord's rebuke. Despite his great power, Michael remains completely submissive to the Lord. The righteous angels have a rank and are submissive to authority. Considering Michael's strength, the archangel's submission to God is all the more beautiful. We can see that submission is never meant to take away an individual's strength or purpose or value. The strength of angel Michael was not under dispute. As the last mention of Michael, the archangel appears in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, as Satan is thrown out of heaven. Confrontation is a necessary evil. No one enjoys it but it must be done in order to rectify, purify, and unify the community. Number 9. Moses Meets Jesus This transfiguration of Jesus is mentioned in each of the Gospel books as an important event in Jesus' life and proof of his divinity. Jesus leads only three of his followers, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain after performing a series of miracles and foretelling his own death. This is the scene of the transfiguration, in which his appearance is radiantly transformed. Matthew chapter 17 verse 2 And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. That glory conveys the royal presence for in his person the kingdom of God is with his people. The inner circle of disciples witness this deep revelation of Jesus' identity as well as his mission. 
During this transfiguration, two of the most important Old Testament figures, Moses and Elijah, appear. Their entrance symbolizes the law and the prophets bearing witness to Jesus the Messiah, who fulfills the Old Testament. Jews view Moses as one of their greatest leaders, but Jesus is even greater. Moses is the one whom God used to give the law, and Elijah is the one who connects the earlier charismatic prophecy of the days of Samuel with the later writing prophets. Moses is also regarded as the model prophet, and Elijah as the Messiah's forerunner. Malachi chapter 4 verses 4 through 6 mentions both the giving of the law through God's servant Moses and the sending of the prophet Elijah before the impending day of the Lord. Their presence on the mountain with Jesus demonstrates Jesus' majesty as the one who will be called the Son of God transcends them both. The cloud of God's presence appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. His Shekinah brightness filled the tabernacle. The cloud of God's presence guided the Israelites in the wilderness, and the cloud of the Lord's glory filled Solomon's temple. Jesus has fulfilled both the law and the prophets, as evidenced by his superiority over Moses and Elijah, whose revelations eventually point to Jesus. Because Jesus is the incarnated Son of God, the ultimate prophet who fulfills Moses' prophecy, the disciples must listen to him in order to understand his messianic mission. When the disciples glance up, they only see Jesus. Their attention is now solely on Jesus, as Moses and Elijah would have preferred, because their ultimate significance was in preparing the way for Messiah, the Son of God, and his redemptive purpose. Although the disciples have had the most explicit revelation of Jesus' identity, they still do not fully comprehend what they have witnessed. Number 10. Moses Sees God Moses asked for God's presence to lead his people to Canaan. Exodus chapter 33 verses 12 through 17 Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, so that I may know you, becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, recognizing and understanding your ways more clearly, in that I may find grace and favor in your sight. And consider also that this nation is your people. And the Lord said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest by bringing you and the people into the promised land. And Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with me, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that your people and I have found favor in your sight? Is it not by your going with us, so that we are distinguished? your people and I from all the other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have asked, for you have found favor, loving kindness, mercy in my sight, and I have known you personally by name. Here we see Moses and God conversing openly and honestly, as if they were friends. God had promised to send an angel to accompany the Israelites, but this did not satisfy Moses. Who exactly was this angel? Moses was curious. Moses desired God's presence to accompany the Israelites, not just an angel. Moses also asked God to teach him his ways, which God granted in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, 
merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children until the third and to the fourth generation. Teach me your ways, so I may know you. Moses had encountered God in a burning bush. He had witnessed God humble Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He had witnessed God part the sea and provide water from a rock. And he had spent forty days and nights on Mount Sinai with God. Moses had witnessed God's signs and wonders. Now he desired to encounter God himself. He desired to have a personal relationship with God. God is more desirable than all of his wonders, works, and blessings combined. Knowing God personally is the greatest blessing any human being can receive. John chapter 17 verse 3 And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. God graciously responded to Moses' desire to know who would go with him, saying, My presence will go with you, that is, with Moses. The you is singular in Hebrew. The Lord was familiar with Moses, and Moses had found favor with him. Moses, on the other hand, was dissatisfied with their relationship. He desired more of God. Even though he had witnessed the burning bush, the opening of the Red Sea, seen water gushing from the rock and eaten bread from heaven, it was all old news to him. He desired to learn more about God. He desired a more in-depth understanding of himself. So Moses said to the Lord, Please teach me your ways, and I will know you. Moses was like a hungry man sitting down to a fine meal. He wasn't satisfied with just nibbling on an appetizer and tasting the soup. He desired to gorge himself on everything the Lord has to offer. Moses understood what the psalm writer said. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you. I thirst for God, the living God. Psalm chapter 42 verses 1 through 2 Every believing heart should have this attitude. God isn't interested in mere churchgoers. He wishes to be known by those who were hungry and thirsty. In fact, knowing God is the meaning of eternal life. Moses, without a doubt, has set a wonderful example of intercession and mediation with God. What a great God-fearing man he was. God approved of him. However, a greater mediator than Moses was yet to come, Jesus Christ, in whom God was also pleased. And because of Christ, Christians also have the same privileges Moses had. We too can know God. We too are friends of God and can speak with him face to face. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. Exodus chapter 33 verse 18 Moses wanted still more. He said to the Lord, Please, let me see your glory. In other words, Moses wanted to see a visible manifestation of the invisible God. He wanted God to go public for him and provide an observable display of his glorious deity. Are you satisfied with listening to a sermon and singing a few songs to God? Or do you constantly long to see more of God in your life, to grasp a greater sense of God's glory? Moses was emboldened to make a final special request. Now show me your glory. Above all, it was God's mercy and compassion that prompted him to renew his covenant with Israel. God then explained how he would demonstrate his goodness, glory to Moses without killing him. 
He described his appearance to Moses using the terms hand, back, and face. Timothy chapter 6 verses 15 through 16 Which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. God's promise to show Moses his goodness, his glory, was fulfilled a short time later, as described in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. Exodus chapter 33, verses 19 through 20. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Moses' request was graciously granted by the Lord. He promised to show him a glimpse of his glory. God would demonstrate his goodness to Moses while proclaiming his own name, the Lord. Even if he were granted that extraordinary encounter, Moses would be unable to see God's face because humans cannot see his face and live. Exodus chapter 33 verses 21 through 23. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place beside me, and you shall stand there on the rock. And while my glory is passing by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and protectively cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. While Moses stood on a rock, God's glory would pass by. God said to him, I will put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back. In other words, the Lord was limiting Moses' exposure to his glory for his own benefit. He could not be subjected to anything more than a glimpse of God's glory from behind. Despite this, his face would literally shine with the wonder of the encounter and the sacredness of speaking to the Lord as a result of even this limited exposure. Of course, because God is spirit, he has no body, and thus no back, just as he has no arm. No one has ever seen God in all his glory, but God's Son has revealed him. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, the one who has seen me has seen the Father, in John chapter 14, verse 9. Until then, we continue to walk by faith with God.